Marker variables are commonly recommended as a solution for method variance problems and they are often applied in research practice. In this video I will explain the concept of a marker variable, some features that marker variables should have and also give an overview of two uh, statistical approaches for working with marker variables. The idea of a marker variable is commonly attributed in this article by Linderell and Whitney in Journal of Applied Psychology. They started from the assumption that there is a single source of method variance that affects all items equally or, or at least to the same proportions. But there is one, one source of method variance and these uh, constructs are another source of variance. Now if we have two constructs that are uncorrelated then the only reason why their measures would be correlated is because of this shared source of method variance. If we can find a construct that we can actually measure that is unrelated to the key constructs in our study, then we would call the measures of that construct marker variables. So we need to have a theoretically unrelated construct. For example, something that people have been using is uh, whether the person likes jazz music or not. When you measure, for example, firm performance and firm innovativeness using a five-point agreement scale, then uh, measuring whether the person likes jazz music on the same scale format could be used as a marker. Assuming, of course, that that marker is affected by the same kinds of biases than the actual variables. But whether a person likes jazz music or not should not in any way be related to uh, the performance or innovativeness of the company that the uh, person responds for. So this is the idea of a marker variable. You find a theoretical unrelated variable and uh, then there are uh, a few different ways of estimating the effect of method variance using the marker. The approach that Lindell and Whitney recommend is taking the smallest correlation between the marker and uh, all the other items or if markers that are a prior designed are not available then take the smallest correlation of all the study variables and use that as a proxy for method variance. This is called the ad hoc marker correlation approach. Marker variables have some merit. So this is actually a technique that, that can be effective but it has some limitations. And marker variables are commonly misapplied. One of the most common ways of, of misapplying this is that you choose a marker that is not affected by the same source of bias as the, the items. For example, if you ask a person to rate uh, things on, on a five-point scale and then you, they, uh, you ask them to report their age and you use the age as a marker, it's ha hardly true that they are how a person responds to a question about their age would be affected by the same kind of biases than how they respond to a rating scale about company performance or innovativeness. There are also misapplications that relate to st statistical techniques and some of the techniques uh, recommended in the literature are actually a, a bit questionable. I will uh, point out some issues here in this video that the existing literature has uh, not pointed out this far. Ad hoc markers generally don't work. So there is, if you try to uh, assess the effect of uh, a method, va me method variance just by looking at the magnitude of the correlations, you run into the same problem that you have with those uh, Harmon single factor test and other simply correlational techniques. It is impossible to say if a high correlation between items is because of a, of a, of a method or because the, the items measure constructs that are highly correlated. Such models are rarely identified. but I'll talk about the identification of those models a bit uh, in another video. But generally ad hoc marker techniques don't really work and should not be used. So a prior chosen marker where you can have a theoretical unrelated construct that is measured may work choosing the smallest correlation among the interesting con constructs or interesting measures does not really work. There are uh, a couple of ways of using markers and the confirmatory factor analysis way that I'll explain in this video is currently the preferred way over uh, another way which is called uh, the correlational technique. Let's take a look at markers in more detail. 
The idea of a marker variable is explained really well in this article by Simmering and co-authors. They uh, explain that the marker should have two key properties. One I already mentioned should be uh, unrelated to uh, any of the study variables. So uh, if you have innovativeness measures and you think that they are suspect to uh, social desirability bias, then you need to have a marker that is unrelated to innovativeness. The construct should be unrelated to innovativeness. For example, whether a person likes jazz music, whether they think the weather is nice outside, something like that. Then uh, another important and often overlooked feature is that the marker should have the same sources of bias as the interesting variables. And this of course assumes if you have a, a one marker, it of course assumes that all indicators that you have are affected by the same kinds of biases. For example, if you think that there is a leniency bias and social desirability bias that affect your items, then your marker should be influenced by those same biases. So if people are, are more lenient in when they self-evaluate, then uh, the marker item should be something that, that people also answer more leniently to. The same for social desirability. This is an important and often overlooked feature of markers. So two important things, theoretical unrelated variables and share the same source of bias. This uh, article by Spectre also talks about marker variables and, and provides a general overview workflow for how to deal with method variance issues. And, and they advocate modeling different sources of method variance, for example, social desirability and uh, extreme response style and, and other things. And have, if you have items that are affected by multiple sources of bias, then you need to have multiple different markers. They also um, make a good point of, of dividing constructs or things that we measure into these five different classes. And generally, if you, most of your constructs are that of interest are, for example, behavioral constructs, then your marker should be behavioral as well. Because uh, behavioral constructs are affected by different kinds of biases than, for example, factual measures. If you have factual measures, if you ask person's height or person's age, there is probably very little bias there. Maybe a person who is, uh, who is uh, 36 m might say that they, they belong to the 30 to 35 category of age because that's, uh, they would like to be a bit younger. But generally the biases in these factual measures are pretty small. And they are certainly different than, for example, these uh, evaluative measures. For example, self-leniency would not probably affect factual measures, but would affect self-evaluations. So you need to think about what is the kind of variables that I have, what are the sources of bias, and then uh, what kind of marker would I, could I use that belongs to the same class of constructs and also would the items would share the same source of bias. There are also uh, variables that are specifically designed or developed to be markers. And this is a nice example. Uh, there is a, a, a construct called blue attitude which uh, measures whether the person likes the color blue or not. And uh, that can be, that's, it's very difficult to uh, come up with a, a reason why that would correlate with anything of interest. But nevertheless, it can be, uh, measures of blue attitude can be used to gauge, for example, is extreme response style and, uh, and other sources of method bias. So uh, this is uh, one way so you can just develop an, an arbitrary construct and then develop measures for it and, and use that. And this has been used in multiple different studies. Then there is also uh, attitude toward neutral ob objects, for example, how much you like public transportation. One problem with using this kind of markers is that if you are, for example, uh, measuring things from CEOs, you are using CEOs as informants. And if you start asking uh, questions like, whether you like color blue or whether you like jazz music or whether it's nice weather outside, that kind of things in the middle of the survey that asks about company strategy or company innovations or performance, that's going to be uh, pretty weird for the informant. And uh, they may switch to a different responding style with those weird items. So uh, one practical thing when you choose your marker should be that even if, if uh, it would be ideal to use a marker that is 
is unconventional for your survey, you need to take care that the informant does not feel weird when answering the question. Here's another example of uh, perhaps a not so good practice, but this is fairly common practice in, in using marker variables. So the article by Tivana in Strategic Management Journal uh, did a cross-sectional survey. They measure things about technology and uh, things about outcomes and all the interesting constructs were measured. Uh, they were rating scales from one to five, strongly disagree to strongly agree and uh, be, these are, are most questions are something that would be affected by social desirability bias. So you want to say that for example uh, uh, they are the relationships are, are stable and, and well understood in the So you want to agree on these items. But then what are the markers? So, so they applied markers and uh, this is a pretty good explanation because there's actually quite a lot of transparency here and they explain the principles. But when we look at the markers, uh, they, the markers that they have is the existence of controlling for, uh, control firm operations in South America, the count of vertical industry segments in which the control firm operates and whether the project software was with, uh, Microsoft Windows. So uh, how, how would these factual statements be affected by the same sources of bias than these statements where the per person evaluates how the company is doing. It's very difficult to see how these items would be affected by the say for example social desirability bias. And indeed this study found no evidence for method variance. And uh, well that's pretty obvious because these markers probably don't capture any of the sources of bias that may affect these items. This does not mean that the study has a method variance problem, but this evidence that they presented is not valid evidence for not being, for there not being a problem. These kind of markers are referred to as uh, shoe size marker variables in the literature. The term was coined by Potsikov and Mackenzie and co-authors and, and they explain that shoe size, person's height, other kinds of things that are factual uh, or demographic variables probably don't work well as markers when you are measuring attitudes. The, the same is explained perhaps a bit better in this article by Williams and co-authors. They also use the term uh, shoe size markers. So it's critically important that your markers are affected by the same sources of bias. There is also evidence that not even all the markers that we measure on the agreement scale like one to five or one to seven are affected the, sa the same by these different sources of bias. There is a study about markers by Simmering that anyone who uses marker variables should read and understand really well before, before proceeding with your study. And they study different markers. The markers that they have, they have these six markers here. They have the blue attitude. Then they have a objective, objective or factual marker, the tenure. They have evaluating markers. They have uh, attitude markers and that kind of things. And they found that when they measured different sources of method variance here, for example, self-deception, overclaiming, uh, extreme response style, either negative or positive, these markers, some of them are insensitive to these method bias sources. And those that are sensitive to the method by variance sources are sensitive to different sources. So uh, it's important that you match your interesting variables how they are affected by the sources of method variance. And, and you choose your markers so that they're affected the same way because not all markers are equal. How do you know whether, uh, for example, your markers are affected by social desirable bias? Well, one is just to, uh, to think through the item. Would it be something that people like to respond positively or negatively? Another thing is that some studies that have actually applied the marker before could have also measured something like, like this a study measures these different sources of method variance. So there's some evidence, not a lot, but some evidence on how markers work and you can use that evidence to make decisions on which markers to adopt to your study. Now let's move on to statistical techniques on how these markers are applied. There are two main techniques. The Lindell and Whitney article originally presented this correlational marker technique. And uh, their technique basically uh, has two variants. You can either uh, 
choose a correlation based on a prior chosen marker. So you choose a correlation between a marker indicator and your key variables or you choose an ad hoc correlation which is the smallest variable, smallest correlation among all your study variables. So if you use the ad hoc technique then you wouldn't have marker variables that are designed in the study but you just use a correlation between the interesting constructs, constructs as a marker. And then you parcel the marker correlation from the correlation matrix. The parceling here basically means that, uh, that you subtract uh, this correlation from all, all correlations in, in the correlation matrix. It doesn't exactly work that but that's, that's the idea. So the actual math is uh, slightly more complicated but the idea is that if there's a, a small level of correlation in the data then uh, you s that is due to the method then you take that correlation away from all study correlations and uh, then you assume that those correlations that are left are purified from any source of method variables. So this is the, uh, the correlation of marker technique. Then there are confirmatory factor analysis marker techniques and uh, these confirmatory factor analysis marker techniques basically involve fitting the normal factor analysis model and including the marker items in that model. Larry Williams talks about these models and his 2010 article presents one of the most commonly used workflows for how to uh, do this kind of analysis. So let's take a look at the problems of these items. There are marker correlation approach has two main problems. One is sampling error and this is acknowledged uh, in the original article as well but they downplay its importance. So the problem basically is that if you choose the smallest correlation then you are going to be choosing a correlation that is affected by sampling error. If your sample size is small then one of the correlations or more one or more of the correlations will be small by chance only. So here we have correlations of 10 variables from a sample size of 100 and the population correlation is 0.25. The smallest correlation is 0.06. So is the 0.06 representative of the, co the uh, overall correlation level between these variables? The answer is no. It's, it's negatively biased because we choose the smallest correlation and this bias increases when the number of in items increases and it also increases when in small samples. So we measure the smallest correlation 0.06 and the population correlation 0.25. So choosing the smallest correlation will uh, indicate that there is no common, so common source of variation in these items where in fact there is. In practice I've never seen an article that applied this ad hoc correlational marker technique and did not conclude that uh, the, the smallest correlation is close to zero. In practice there's always one correlation or more correlations that are close to zero and unless your sample size is very large and your theory is very strong and then, then you can basically just conclude that the smallest correlation is small therefore no problem. So this is kind of like a get away from a jail free card. It doesn't really really work that well. So this technique using an ad hoc correlation can seriously uh, underestimate the magnitude of the problem. Then there's another problem. I mentioned this also in another, another video but uh, parceling out a correlation is basically equivalent to, to fitting a model where you have one method factor that loads on all the items equally. And, and then when you parcel out this method factor you're basically uh, modeling these uh, taking the residuals, what is left after the method and then assuming that that is the, the variance of interest. Well there are, um, the problem with this is that the method implies a constant correlation. So, uh, but we just saw in, in the, the table from Simmering that not all sources of method affect all items equally. So this is an unrealistic model and if you fit an unrealistic and misspecified model to the data then uh, the results are generally not trustworthy. There is also uh, the implied covariance uh, or the implied small correlations basically the variance of the method factor and now the question is that why would we uh, take that variance of the method factor based on the smallest correlation instead of simply estimating it using this model. 
I'm not saying that this model is useful even if it was estimated, but it seems that it is even less useful when you just take a, a correlation instead of estimating the model fully. At least when you estimate this model and when your software tells you that the model is not, not identified, you know that you have a problem. If you take a smallest correlation and then fix uh, the method factor variance to the smallest correlation, then your software will not know that there is an identification problem. Finally, um, this is equivalent to estimating a factor model of residuals. So it's basically equivalent to running first a factor analysis, uh, fixing all the loadings to be the same, and then taking residual covariances and then estimating these factors on, on the, those covariances. The problem again is that uh, this method factor also assumes variance or covariance between the constructs, so it cannot really uh, differentiate between construct related variance and method variance that well. A lot more defensible approach is to use the actual marker variables and use them in a confronter factor analysis model. And this is that what the literature recommends. And this is from the Williams paper 2010. And uh, he shows that the way to use marker variables is that you have these, these constructs that are correlated. And, and these are the interesting constructs or interesting uh, the factors that are the interesting constructs. And these are the interesting uh, the measures of the interesting constructs. And then you have the marker measures and you have a factor for the markers and that factor also influences these, uh, these uh, interesting measures. And then Williams goes and, and explains uh, a series of a sequence of modeling of different kinds of nested models that you can, you can do uh, to test different assumptions about the uh, method variance. This, uh, they are using, uh, in an empirical example, benefits administration. They are using that as a marker and that has been used in a couple of studies by Williams. And but now if we think about that these items measure benefits uh, administration, what does the, uh, the benefits factor or the marker variable factor here actually present? Is it the benefits, benefits administration construct or is it the source of method variance? We don't really know. This is uh, if we say that these items are correlated only because they, they share one source of variation, then that one source of variation would be a combination of the benefits administration construct and the method. And you're basically confounding the method variance with the benefits administration construct if you, if you do uh, it this way. And that is something that the literature has not really noticed yet. So a much more defensible approach would be to um, model it this way. So uh, like you, you're saying that these items that you have here are affected by constructs and they're also affected by the measurement approach. And uh, these items here should be also affected by the constructs, construct which is your marker construct and the method variance source. So this is a, a, a more uh, accurate presentation of the data and it also uh, solves the issue that you commonly have that these marker items load very highly on the, on the marker construct and the marker construct does not really affect or marker factor doesn't really affect the other items. So this gives you a more accurate representation of the source of method variance and if there really is, is one source of method variance then this kind of model should be able to estimate that consistently and as long as you have a, a large sample size then the estimate should be trustworthy. Now there is another issue if you add this um, second factor here. Now this is a full bifactor model so you have every indicator loading on on two different factors. So if you have a bifactor model where uh, the general factor loads on some indicators that don't have a minor factor, then that model is generally identified. However, when you have a full bifactor model, then identification becomes problematic because of these correlations. I'll talk about the identification of this kind of models in another video, but at this point it's useful to understand that if you add this secondary factor, which makes a lot of sense to do, and which the existing literature has not really figured out yet, then uh, you run into an, an is question of whether this is identified or not. It is identified in some scenarios, it's not identified in other scenarios, so it's important to understand. So conclusions on marker variables. Marker variables are potentially useful 
there is a lot of bad practice, for example, suicide markers uh, using the correlational technique instead of the confrontative factor analysis technique, not considering uh, whether the marker is influenced by the same source of bias than the key variables that you're studying and so on. But more thoughtful choice of markers, if you actually go through the, the, uh, the constructs that you're studying and the items that you have for those constructs and then uh, make a list of potential sources of method variants that could affect the items and then choose your markers that in a way that they are affected by those same sources of method variants. Then markers can work. This article by, by Simmering and then uh, another article by Spectre in 2019 that I cited in earlier in, in, this art, in this presentation talk about the choose choice of marker variables in great detail. So if you choose your markers in a way that they actually are affected by the same sort of bias, then the markers are potentially useful. Also, if you use the converter factor analysis technique and the full bifactor model, and you can ensure that that is uh, identified, then uh, your results are potentially trustworthy, if you, even if you do a cross-sectional study. However, this is easier said than done, and I'll talk about uh, the modeling of method factors in another video.